Hello, welcome to the BDR.net lunch gathering videos. We get together every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern and we cover a wide range of topics. So we invite you to enjoy this one and come visit us any Thursday that's convenient. We're at www.thebdr.net. That's the BDR.net. And we'd be happy to show you the engineering articles, IT articles, history articles, things that you'll find of interest. So again, thank you for coming. Enjoy the video. Take care. Today, I am really pleased to have Hank Landsberg back with us. And Hank is not only a manufacturer of some really great equipment that a lot of people have found uh, important or essential in their operation, but Hank was back there at the beginning or almost the beginning, I'm not going to make it that old, Hank, uh, when, uh, when automation started to change the way broadcast worked. <laughs> and, and, and remember that uh, we went from a board op and talent to combo. And then in the, what, late 50s, early 60s? Well, we'll let Hank take over here and uh, talk to us about it. And then later on, uh, we got some time for questions, some experiences, some memories. Uh, and if you've got some pictures of your automation experience, please pass them along to us. Hank? Okay, well, thank you. And uh, th this will be fun. <laughs> um, and I can tell here by, by looking at uh, everybody's picture that I, I suspect a, a lot of you will uh, remember a lot of these uh, the days of uh, antique analog automation. Um, and uh, you saw my, my clock that I had uh, resurrected from the garage this morning, a uh, Gates uh, master clock. Um, so I guess we'll go back. Uh, there, you know, there's a handful of people here who are not as old as me. So I'll, I'll, I'll give a little bit of uh, background. And I do have a, a bunch of pictures. Uh, from uh, my days at Drake Chenault. I started at Drake Chenault in, um, let's see, the spring of 74. Um, but let me go back a little bit uh, before that. Um, FM kind of got its start in the late 50s, early 60s. That's before it was stereo. I forget when stereo came along, early 60s. Um, and yes, I do remember tuners that would not um, recognize stations that were not broadcasting in stereo. And then they did outlaw that so that uh, the tuner manufacturers and car radio manufacturers, they, had, they, could not, uh, they could not filter out stations that were still in mono. But in any case, so we had, so we had FM just getting started in the, uh, early 60s and, and in those days listenership was practically nothing so uh, stations didn't want to invest any money in personnel or programming and the vast majority of FM stations were owned by broadcasters who already had AM stations so programming on FM was took one of two paths either they put on, uh, they simply simulcasted their AM programming, which was probably in mono. Uh, or if they didn't want to do that, or if they didn't have an, an AM station that they could simulcast, uh, they would uh, very often program uh, elevator music, you know, easy listening, dentist office music, you know, whatever. And there were <coughs> a handful of companies that, that syndicated uh, that kind of music on reels of tape. And it was really simple because hardly anybody was listening. There was very little advertising. There was, it wasn't really a personality driven format. It was just wall to wall music. And, and uh, either stations would build a sort of a quasi automation system themselves out of a couple of reel to reel decks or they would buy something that was really simple 
usually two or three reel-to-reel -reel decks in a cart machine, and it would just sit there in the cycle sequence from deck one, deck two, deck three, ID on a cart, deck one, deck two, deck three, ID on a cart, over and over and over. Very simple, nothing to it. Well, uh, and that was fine until uh, somewhere, I think in the late 60s, or maybe early 70s, uh, the FCC decided this is a waste of spectrum to be either duplicating, to, to be duplicating programming that's already on AM. So they basically banned simulcasting. So now you had a whole bunch of stations, a bunch of FM stations that uh, had no source of programming for their FM, uh, but they still had very low listenership, uh, no advertising to speak of. So they were back in the same boat. They needed a way of putting some uh, unique programming on the air uh, without spending any money. They didn't want to spend a ton of money on personnel or programmers or any of that stuff, you know, personalities, no way. So they just wanted an easy, inexpensive way to uh, put some programming on their FM station. Because um, if they didn't, they would have to turn the license back in. So that's where automation uh, got its, its start, really. And uh, the hard part was the existing automation systems that were really intended for just background music um, couldn't really handle anything that you'd consider a pop music format that was fast paced, needed tight segues, a lot of commercials, uh, IDs, jingles, liners, maybe even telling the time somehow. Um, the, the, the older automation systems, you know, they use 25 Hertz tones at the end of each song to trigger the next event. And that was fine, uh, but reel-to-reel -reel decks, you know, they don't start instantaneously like a cart machine. They, you need at least a half a second or a second to, to get them going before they, you know, prevent the, prevent the song from wowing in. Uh, so the, the technical uh, challenge, the technical challenge was figuring out how to use a bunch of reel-to-reel -reel decks to create a fast-paced format that wouldn't sound uh, canned or, or automated. And it wouldn't have a, a second of dead air between each song because that would never fly on, on uh, pop music, you know, whether it's top 40 or country or whatever. So um, that's about the time, that was in the early 70s. And that was about the time when I started at, uh, at Drake Chenault. Uh, Drake Chenault was one of, I don't know, maybe seven or eight programming syndicators. There was uh, TM Productions, Century 21, uh, BPI up in Seattle, uh, Peters Productions down in San Diego, uh, IGM, International Good Music, um, and a handful of other smaller guys. And at the time, I think we had Oh, uh, maybe four formats, uh, top 40, um, hit parade, oldies, and country. Um, and in 74, let me go to some pictures here. Uh, in 74, um, we had probably, I don't know, maybe seven, 70 or 80 uh, client radio stations, and there were two studios. Let's see if I can do this right. Uh, whoops. Can you see that? Yes, sir. Okay, well, that was the, uh, when I first got there in 74, uh, we had two studios. This was Studio A. Uh, Turntable, a couple of Sony tape decks, uh, a C-Tech console, uh, and a few other odds and ends over here, a couple of uh, limiters and a cart machine. Uh, but the interesting th 
thing to note is the Sony four track quarter inch tape recorder. This is where we did our mass <clears throat> or mastering on a four track machine. And this is why, <coughs> excuse me, you have to go, go back to the issue of how do you, how do you get a, a, a slow responding reel to reel tape machine in an automation deck to start fast enough and tight enough to produce tight music segues. Um, and the way, you, the way we ended up doing it was instead of putting the, the 25 hertz Q-tone at the logical segue point at the end of the song, we put it on one second early. That way, the next deck would start one second early, and it would be, and the and the next deck would be cued one second ahead of the start of the next song. So everything ran on this one second advance. Uh, the Q tone would come along one second before the logical segue point. The next deck would start one second before the song was supposed to 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 actually start, and it would have one second to come up to speed and get stable before audio started. So that's easier said than done. So the way we did it at Drake Chenault was when we did the master tapes in the studios on these four track decks, um, we used two tracks for audio left and right. And the third track was for the Q-tone, but it wasn't the 25 Hertz tone and it wasn't advanced one second. The Q tone on the master was in real time. And it was a one kilohertz tone that was on a separate track and easily audible by the guy in the studio. So that, that one kilohertz Q would go at the logical segue point at the end of the song, right where the next song should hit. And then we'll go to another picture. Uh, let's see, let me find my, here we go. Okay, then we would take that four track master and make a copy of it on this kludge. <laughs> And what you don't see here is the four track master playback deck, but hidden down in this middle rack um, was a uh, thing that sensed that one kilohertz real time Q tone and essentially stretched it. This whole thing ran tails out. So we would play the master tape backwards, playing from end to beginning. And this thing in the middle would sense the one kilohertz Q tone. When it saw it, when it picked that up, it would trigger a 25 hertz oscillator, which would inject a 25 hertz tone in the left channel audio. When the one kilohertz Q tone went away, which was actually the beginning of the tone because we're playing in tails out here. When that one kilohertz tone went away, the 25 hertz oscillator would stay on for one second. So it essentially stretched the 25 hertz tone so it would start exactly one second before the one kilohertz tone on the master. So that's how we were able to get very accurate one second advance on the 25 hertz Q tones that were on the station copies. Now that thing that I just showed you wasn't, wasn't made for creating station copies. That, would, that system would create a single um, uh, submaster, which was a duplication master, which was then sent over to SuperScope tape duplicating, which is about 10 miles away in San Fernando Valley, and they would make high speed copies, uh, as many as we needed, you know, whether it was 20 or 50 or 100 or whatever. 
they would use uh, their high-speed duplicating gear to create copies from our submaster. And those copies is, are what we would uh, ship out to our client stations. And this got to be really hairy because uh, as with, you know, when a, with FM stereo, you know, in the early days, uh, there were an awful lot of listeners listening on mono radios. And of course, you know, the scourge of stereo is phase shift between the two channels. And, oh, did I mention that all of our masters were done at seven and a half IPS? Hmm. And that, cop that tape was duplicated onto the submaster and the submaster was duplicated at high speed onto the station copies. And at seven and a half IPS, it doesn't take much azimuth error to produce some pretty nasty phase shifts between the two channels. And we fought this with Superscope because they really didn't understand how critical this was. So, um, show you another picture here. So shortly after I got there in about 76, uh, we built our first in-house um, tape duplicating system. And there it is, uh, built out of a whole bunch of Crown SX722 uh, recorders. Um, over here on the side, you can see where the uh, four track master tape would play back. And uh, this duplicating system had the same arrangement as in that other rack of gear I showed you a few minutes ago. Uh, it ran tails out, picked up the, the one kilohertz real-time Q-tone on the master, generated the uh, 25 hertz tone, which was injected into the audio, and it did the, did the, uh, the stretching thing. So this is where we, we did our first um, in-house duplication. Uh, and this worked out okay. Uh, I learned that these crown machines looked more precision <laughs> than they actually were. <laughs> the transports in them uh, sort of reminded me of something that somebody would build in their garage. So I was underwhelmed, but they worked. And the other nice thing about doing our own in-house duplication was we were now, uh, sending second generation copies to the clients instead of third. We eliminated that, that middle step. Um, and a few years after that, uh, we built an even better in-house tape duplication system using these uh, Technics RS 1500s. Uh, I saw their closed loop tape drive uh, for being consumer, what is really a consumer machine. They were extraordinarily well designed and well made. Uh, they would hold phase to 15 kilohertz within 20, 30 degrees. I mean, solid as a rock. Um, we had 24 of these machines and the whole system ran at double speed. Uh, the master and the, and the slaves would all run at 15 IPS. Uh, so every 45 minutes, we got 24 tape copies and they were all second generation, very good audio quality and amazingly good uh, azimuth stability. Um, Frequency response and all that stuff was, was really good. It was dead flat out to about uh, 15 kilohertz. So we ran the hell out of these machines starting in, let's see, about 1980 for uh, 12 years, these things ran two shifts a day, sometimes three, uh, ran and ran and ran, and you, you couldn't kill them. They just keep on running. They're amazing. 
I'm sure when they designed them, they never thought they'd be used in this kind of an application, but they ended up working out really well. Um, so anyway, uh, that's how we how we did uh, some of the the tape uh, copy production, um, and then um, I showed you one of this earlier studios. Here's another picture of um, one of the original studios, Studio B. Um, and as you probably noticed, there was an awful lot of consumer gear at uh, DC for various reasons. Financial was, <laughs> was one of them. Um, this is the studio where the history of rock and roll was, was produced in 78. Um, and the, the company was growing by leaps and bounds. Um, and it got to the point in about 77 when uh, we had, we just had too much consumer gear, not enough pro gear. Uh, the place wasn't reliable enough. We had just a lot of problems that, uh, that I ended up having fixed to fix and work around and all that stuff. And at some point I just went to uh, Mr. Chenault and said, you know, if we're gonna grow and be reliable and be able to pump these tapes out every week, uh, we gotta get serious about rebuilding the place. So I proposed, and at the time we had five studios uh, nearly all of which was built out of consumer hi-fi gear, you know, Sony tape decks and Tascam crappy consoles and all this, you know, sort of mediocre stuff. It's amazing that the end product sounded as good as it did considering the, 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 uh, the stuff, that we, the gear we were working with. So anyway, to make a long story short, um, I said, we need to build five new studios and they need to be pro gear, you know, built from the ground up to be used and abused 24 seven without falling apart. So we, that's the product, uh, the project that we started in uh, 78. And we built five studios. It took a couple of years because we kind of did them piece by piece or, you know, one studio at a time. Um, and um, I'll show you a few other pictures. Um, when it came to picking an uh, audio console for the studios, that was a real issue because we were kind of like a radio station, but not really. And we were kind of like a recording studio, but not really. We were a little bit of both. So, um, to make a long story short, I ended up designing the consoles uh, and we built them from scratch. Um, here's a picture of uh, machining the top panels for the audio consoles. Um, so we, we, we built these things uh, literally from scratch. The job I had before I worked at with Drake Chenault, uh, I worked in Pasadena for a place called Visual Electronic Labs. I think they were a Canadian company, but they had, for whatever reason in Pasadena, they had a, a division that built custom audio consoles for radio and TV stations. And uh, that's where I learned about designing consoles for radio and radio stations. So um, here is the finished Product. This is the console we um, ended up with. And uh, we built six of these. Uh, and the uh, emphasis was on the thing being really versatile and having some features of a radio board, but some features of a recording studio board. Um, you can see the red buttons here. 
and the green buttons right above. We had two stereo mix buses, program and audition. Uh, cue override buttons up here uh, and monitor solo buttons up on top. Um, these kind of worked like, like a tape monitor button on an old hi-fi preamp. Um, we had, uh, I think, what, uh, 12, 12 pots for 12 inputs, a um, couple of aux sends for uh, headphone audio mix and uh, reverb, because we occasionally used reverb, and uh, a few other odds and ends on here. So this was kind of a, a um, hybrid of a radio board and a recording studio board. Um, these are timers up above, you know, it's like a digital stopwatch, that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, so anyway, this is the console that, uh, that we used. And What's on uh, the far right-hand side up in the uh, panel that's got various knobs on it? Uh, oh, that was monitor stuff, monitor level and uh, monitor select and intercom, things like that. Um, so now let's take a look at, uh, the studios. Uh, let's see here. You delivered your tapes in the nicest boxes. Oh, thank you. Uh, okay. Where did I go here? Uh, those, More those pizzas boxes arriving always... from... More pizzas from Greg Chenault, right? Yeah, right. Those boxes always look like they spared no expense on anything. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I lost my... Wait a minute. Let me uh, get out of this. There we go. Okay, now let's see. Let me find you a... Uh, overview of the uh, studio. Now oh, this picture will work good. Share screen, there we go. Okay, so, um, this was the, the new studios, big, big upgrade from <laughs> the uh, mess that we had before. Uh, we went with uh, predominantly um, MCI tape recorders uh, and we uh, ordered these machines as three track machines with custom heads that I had made uh, by Nortronics. Um, we stayed with quarter inch tape, but uh, we had some custom heads made that were essentially the same as a standard two track head, except with a really skinny Q track in the middle uh, of what would norm normally be the guard band. So um, the master recorders in each studio were three track machines with these custom three track heads. Uh, so we had um, usually two master recorders, these two here, console in the middle, uh, usually another two track MCI over here that they'd use for voice tracks. Um, when it came to the turntables, and of course all the music came off of vinyl in those days. So we really went to great extremes to uh, uh, get really good audio off the vinyl. Let me show you another picture of uh, what we used for the turntables. There we go. So this is a close-up. Can you see that? Yep. Of the turntable bay. Uh, an SP10 turntable with a Stax UA7 carbon fiber arm. We use Sure V15 uh, phono cartridges. Uh, and then at the top, this is a Kenwood uh, super duper audiophile grade phono preamp. Uh, and then uh, earlier, earlier when you guys were talking, you were mentioning the Berwyn uh, 
noise eliminators, eliminators and stuff. We had the Berwyn tick and pop filter and then the uh, Berwyn uh, dynamic noise filter. Uh, the EQ was usually not used. Um, one thing that we did do that was kind of unique is, and you can't really see it, but there's a knob here that is uh, for a thing called a low frequency crossover. It's basically a big inductor that you hang between the two channels and it allows the mono to, uh, the, the low frequencies to combine. And <laughs> the reason for that was the floors in this building were weak and they would vibrate when people walked, walked by the studio. And that would create all kinds of rumble and noise and stuff. So instead of just rolling off the low end, um, I put in these low frequency crossovers so that it would mono out the bass below about 100 hertz or 150 hertz. And that would effectively cancel out the low frequency uh, vibration without getting rid of the bass in the music. So that was another one of our tricks of the trade. Um, then the other, other critical thing about producing automation tapes is the, uh, the timing of the cue tones and the space between songs on the reels has to be dead on the money. Um, I mean, within 50 milliseconds, if you want your segues to be consistently tight. Uh, and the way we did that was I designed a uh, thing called a dead roll controller. Oh, where are we? Oh. Have to get back to. Uh, now my Zoom icon has disappeared. Probably have too many windows open. Let's see, here we go. There we go. Okay, let's see, where did it go? Okay, can you see that? No, no, there we go. Uh, this was the uh, automation controller or the, or the, uh, the uh, studio automation controller. So uh, the way this would work is, and the whole, I the whole idea here is to make sure that- We're, we're seeing all of your pictures in your- Oh. Uh, uh, oh, there we go. There we go, all right. Is that better? Yep. You just not see very big time. though. Okay, yeah, it's not very big. Anyway, it's not much to look at. Anyway, the idea here was to make sure that there was exactly three seconds of tape, blank tape between the end of one song and the beginning of the next. So uh, the way that was done is uh, the guy in the studio would queue up the the record to the beginning of audio. And then you would cue the master tape uh, about five seconds before the end of the previous song on the, on the reel and hit one button and everything would start. The, the, the tape, the master would start playing back when it sensed the end of the uh, cue tone for the previous song, it would go into record start a timing cycle. At the appropriate time, it would start the turntable. And then at exactly three seconds, it would open up audio from the turntable. And uh, so that would produce exactly three seconds of blank tape between the end of one song and the beginning of the next. And that was within, usually within about 50 milliseconds. So it was very accurate and very consistent. 
Uh, how did you get how did you get consistent cueing of the turntable? Oh, you? okay. Well, that was done. Um, uh, the guy would cue up, you know, the record, you know, uh, cue the record to the beginning of audio, and then back it up by exactly whatever the distance was, you know, two inches or three inches, whatever, whatever there were marks on the turntable, you know, he would back it up and then turn the audio off. The, the turntable audio was controlled, okay? And by setting accurate timing on when the turntable would start and when the audio would open up, that's how we got that exact timing. So just as the beginning of the song hit the stylus, that's when audio from the turntable would be turned on. And those sure V15 cartridges could be back. Uh, yeah, yeah, like they that could. Without breaking them? Wow. Yeah, believe it or not, yeah, you, you could, as long as you were, you know, pretty careful. Uh, those things were more rugged than, than you might think. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's how, we do, how we did that. Uh, let's see. Let me let me take another quick look at my photos. See what else uh, might be sort of interesting. Okay, let's see here. Who who built your cabinets? Those uh, the, like the, the old uh, gully. Uh, the the cabinetry um, was built by Hank Lansbury. Uh, no, no, uh, that's. Al was it a Russ Lang? It was another Hank. A guy named uh, Hal Norton. He was an L.A. guy who built a lot of cabinetry for a lot of radio stations. Stuck with Norton. That was the name of the, of the company, or the two guys. The, first, the one guy's name, his last name was Stuck, and the other guy was Norton. So the, the company was called Stuck with Norton. And, and they built... Um, <laughs> Lots of studios for a lot of LA stations. So uh, that, that's where all that cabinetry came from. The, um, uh, the, uh, the consoles were painted to match the same color as the MCI recorders. Um, I liked the uh, color of the Pacific recorders cabinetry, which was kind of a rosewood uh, laminate. So that's what we used for uh, the cabinetry. So it looked kind of like a Pacific Recorders installation, even though it wasn't. In fact, we bought the um, roll around cabinets for the MCI machines. We bought those from Pacific Recorders. They were kind of, they were kind of puzzled as to why somebody was <laughs> ordering 20 recorder cabinets, but not the recorders. Well, because we got the recorders from someplace else. Um, let's see, I was gonna show, uh, let's see, how do I get back to, there. Uh, let's see. I'll show a few more pictures. Uh, so you were you were tapes were going out to different stations each week in different formats. Yeah, we How, had time, yeah, by the time we rolled or we got to like the early 80s, we had about seven or eight music formats and 300 stations. And we were shipping um, uh, we were shipping almost a thousand reels a week, a thousand 10 inch reels of tape uh, per week. It how, was a, how was the content on each reel determined in terms of like a format might have a, a, a current reel, a recurrent reel or something? What was going out on these thousand reels? What was oh, okay. the And how okay. did you determine that? Okay, um, yeah, good question. Um, that was done, um, we had programming people that, that did that. Um, here's a close up of the uh, three track heads. You can see audio track on top and on the bottom, this really skinny little thing in the middle, that was a 10 mil Q track for our studio Q tones. Um, so uh, most of the formats worked, uh, based on four, four reels that you, you have in rotation on the automation system. Uh, one was a current, which was the current hits of that week. And that, that was shipped every week. Then there was a recurrent, which was kind of the cream of the crop. 
of the past few weeks of currents. Uh, and those would go out every other week. And then there were uh, basic library reels, which uh, would be reels three and four. Uh, and those were, were uh, produced about once a year for each format. So for, your, for the, the basic library reels, there would be maybe 40 to 50 reels in the basic library. And each reel would have maybe 20 songs. So, you know, you'd have, um, you know, 800 or so songs in the library, plus uh, 20 currents, 20 to 25 currents, and 20 to 25 recurrents. And those would be, you know, refreshed every week. So with 300 stations, um, just on the average, uh, that would be almost 500 reels a week, just of the currents and recurrents. Plus, uh, when those stations needed their basic library updated, that's another 40 or 50 reels that would get, you know, shipped, not necessarily all at once, but, you know, in groups of maybe 10, every couple of months, we'd send them another 10 that would replace 10 from their, their old reels. Um, so that's how, how that happened. Hank, what was the price of uh, the service to the stations? You know, I don't really know. It depended on the market size. Um, anywhere from, I think, at the low end, maybe $1,000 a month plus real charges and shipping up to maybe three or $4,000 a month. So that you know, gives you kind of a, a ballpark. Hank, one of the things that uh, you did, you talked about some of the tricks with the mechanics, uh, but one of the tricks you guys did that I thought was very important, I, I mentioned it to you, is the voicing and the way the reels overlapped intentionally. Oh, yeah. yeah. And would you like to explain that a little bit? Yeah. Um, the uh, Most of the li basic library reels had voice tracks built into them. All the Drake all hard on uh, Harry, have, all the Drake all tapes had built-in voice hard. tracks. You didn't need a separate voice track reel. Most of the basic library reels had a back announce. So at the end of the song, our our announcement would be, you know, something like uh, that's the Rolling Stones or something like that. Um, some of them were announced, some were not. The older songs generally were not. The more current stuff was. Um, the, the currents, the recurrents never were announced because those were songs that had recently been on the top 40 that everybody knew and they really didn't need to be announced. The current songs, which would be the current hits of that week, uh, were usually announced either front announced or back announced, you know, so it would be, you know, um, here's Crosby, Stills and Nash for a front announce or that was so-and-so, you know, that's held and ready, you know, as a back announce. And the key to making all this stuff work was absolute consistency, um, levels, EQ, phase, timing, Q tone placement. I mean, if you're if you're making your own automation tapes for your own station, it's not a big deal. But when you ship 50 reels out to somebody, and then a year later you ship currents to them, so you have tapes that are a week old segueing into tapes that are a year old that were done by a different guy in a different studio a year apart, you have to have absolute consistency uh, in order for everything to sound seamless. And, and that, was, that was our, our, uh, our, our bugaboo. That was the thing we really paid attention to. Um, at the beginning and the end of every reel we produced, 
there was a full set of alignment tones, not just level, but level, head azimuth, and a frequency response run from 1K out to 15K or whatever. Um, and all the, those tones get, got recorded on the master. And then they got duplicated onto the copy. And every copy that came off the, the duplicating system, uh, let me show you here. Where did it go? There we go. Every tape copy that came off the duplicating system was checked on this QC deck. And if you remember, if you look, remember seeing the studio pictures, every studio had an oscillator. Every studio had a vector scope for looking at phase and head azimuth. And um, every tape copy that came off of our dupe system, the head tones were checked for, for level, EQ, and head azimuth, you know, phase up here. And uh, what's really unique about the way we did things was all of our studio guys did the things. I mean, if you have a radio station and your, your, your engineer might come through the studio and set the levels and set the head azimuth, what, once a week maybe? Well, our studio guys were trained how to do that. Um, <laughs> You probably noticed that all the tape machines in the studios, none of them had the head covers on them. You know, all the head covers were removed because every time a piece of tape went on that machine, the studio guy knew how to adjust the head azimuth by looking at the vector scope, you know, to set for minimum phase error. They knew how to set levels. They knew how to set uh, playback and record EQ. Um, they made those adjustments for every single reel of tape that went on the machine, whether it was being played back or recorded. So the, the, the secret to the consistency was the things that a radio station engineer would typically do once a week, our studio guys were doing a hundred times a day. Um, and the end result was when you took a reel of tape that was, you know, a year old and it segued into a reel of tape that was produced last week, they were dead accurate. Levels, EQ, phase, um, voice track levels and all that stuff, Q point, Q, uh, Q tone timing and all that stuff, dead on the money every time. And that was one of the things that um, our customers raved about. Uh, because there were a lot of automation uh, programming syndicators out there that were just kind of doing this on the fly with, with a 25 hertz tone generator and they'd take a wild guess at where to hit the button. And sometimes it was okay, sometimes it was, just, it was tight or it was loose or, it, you know, whatever. Uh, that never happened with, with DC stuff. Uh, the, the tapes that we sent, that we turned out, the, the place ran like a really finely tuned watch. It was, it was a factory. It was a programming factory, but a really good one. Did you have a rule Dave, that no, no cold opens? The... Say again? Did you Did have you... a rule no cold opens? You mean um, voice track with a cold Correct. voice track? Uh, no, no. Uh, music always hit first and, and then the voice track would lay over the intro if there was enough time for it. If not, we, we'd do a back and outs. Hank, were you always working with fresh and brand new tape? Uh, you didn't get the reels back to reuse. No, uh, no, we never, uh, once the reels left, they never came back. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was always, it was always new, new tape. It was uh, 3M 177, one mil. Uh, Hank, um, on your uh, reel to reels, you showed those special heads. Are they similar to what uh, Pacific was doing on the uh, Max tracks for their carts? I, I think they were similar. I, I think Pacific Recorders put the Q track on the bottom. Are they were they similar to Nagras? I think so. 
The reason we wanted the Q-Track in the middle is because I wanted uh, a head configuration that was still compatible with standard two-track. I think the, the Pacific Recorders format was left, right, Q, and the Q was on a skinny track at the bottom, which is fine for cart machines, but you can't use that configuration for a standard two-track, uh, you know, uh, arrangement. So yeah, at least what we, were, what we were doing was compatible with standard two track. And those studios didn't have one little blue box, huh? No, but that's the old studios is where I got the idea for all the blue boxes. <laughs> uh, with all that damn consumer equipment, it was all minus 10, but of course the consoles were all plus four. I must have built 20 match boxes out of op amp labs plugins, you know, to interface everything. And at some point, it kind of dawned on me, hmm, I bet everybody else is in the same boat, too. So that's where the matchbox came from. I was surprised you didn't use uh, the straight wire audio preamps for the turntables. Um, I don't remember why we didn't. Um, I don't remember. I, I'm not even sure I knew about Bill Sachs back in those days. Well, hey, was you have a particular company that you were happy to work with uh, on the uh, playback end, uh, Hank? Did you have trouble, say, IGM versus SMC? Oh, or The automation companies, you mean? Yeah. Well, no, no, it, they, they all worked. Um, um, we didn't really have any problems one way or the other. Uh, the... Uh, a lot of the automation tapes that were being made in those days had really lousy low end because they would roll off everything below 100 hertz. Mm -hmm. And I wanted there to be good, good bass response on our tapes. So the filters that I had made, I had them made by uh, TTE, I think, in Los Angeles. Uh, I told them to make them flat down to 35 and then sharp cutoff below that. So we had we had good solid low end on our tapes. Well, we discovered that some of the sloppier tone <laughs> sensors out there would occasionally uh, false trip on songs that had good low end because the bandwidth of the tone sensor was a little on the wide side, but uh, they, were able to, they were able to fix that at, uh, at the radio station end of things. Good. I've got a question for you, Hank. What uh, was the thing that led th to the demise of what you were doing? I mean, at some point you started to see the writing on the wall and said there's changes coming and either you're going to embrace those changes and continue on yeah. or not. What? Yeah. What, tell us well, about that. Here's what, here's what happened. And it's kind of too bad. Uh, in 80... Uh, 86, um, Gene Chenault, it, prior to 86, somewhere in the late, eh, early 80s, uh, Gene Chenault had bought out Bill Drake. So Gene owned the whole company. Gene Chenault, by the way, was a nice guy, a really nice, very, he was a gentleman. And Bill Drake was a great guy too. Um, they were they were wonderful people. Um, in '86, Gene sold the company to uh, somebody, and I don't remember his name. Wagon Train Enterprises out of Albuquerque, uh, and this was right about the time when uh, TM or no Century Twenty One was. Uh, converting their automation products, their pro automation programming from reel-to-reel -reel tape to compact disc. And in about 84, 85, I had proposed this to the management at Drake Chenault. Well, in those days, that was the very early days of compact disc production. And uh, I mean, it was way before things like CD writers. You know, if you wanted to produce CDs, you had to have them pressed. And the, there was a huge upfront cost for uh, creating 
what was called the glass master from which the CDs would be pressed. I mean, tens of thousands of dollars per master. Uh, so at the time, um, the uh, management at Drake Chanel wasn't interested. And then in 86, they sold the company to Wagon Train. Wagon Train moved the whole shebang to Albuquerque. Uh, some DC people went with them, many did not. I did not, even though I stayed, out, stayed on as sort of a long distance uh, consultant guy. Um, but the guy who bought the company was strapped for cash and he didn't have the money to invest in what it would take to convert the formats over to CD. And the other thing that was coming on real strong in those days was satellite programming. So the next best thing was to uh, sell the formats as uh, satellite delivered programming. But again, in those days, satellite uplink time cost a fortune and they didn't have the cash for that. So what they did was they partnered with Jones Intercable, a cable TV company out of Denver. So they basically sold part of the company or gave part of the company to Jones in exchange for free satellite uplink time. And some of the formats converted to satellite delivery and in the meantime, um, TM Productions was bailing out of the tape business. So Drake Chenault bought the TM tape clients. Same thing happened with Century 21. Drake Chenault bought the remaining tape clients of uh, Century 21. Um, so now Drake Chenault was hanging on with tape clients and satellite. But every month that went by, more and more of those tape clients went away. They either went to CD delivered programming or satellite. So that, that market just shrank, 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 shrank. Pretty soon there was nothing left of it. And at some point, all that was left of Drake Chenault was producing programming for Jones Intercable. And I think what happened somewhere along the line is uh, BPI up in Santa in Seattle, Broadcast Programming International, bought what was left of the tape clients from Drake Chenault. Drake Chenault continued to exist, supplying programming for Jones, and that went on for a few years, and then it just ended. So that's and John Tyler. Satellite Music Network. Yeah, yeah. And then satellites took off after that. And, uh, and then it wasn't too much, you know, long after that when uh, hard drive storage became a possibility. And, and of course today <laughs> you can get free software and the $500 PC or a laptop and do all the things we were doing back in the 70s that required, you know, $50,000 worth of automation, automation equipment and weekly tapes and weekly, you know, updates. Um, Sony jukebox. Yeah, you can, you, can, you can do it so easily these days. The, 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 the most, uh, I'm sure you all remember, remember uh, how we did time and outs, um, time and outs carts with automation, mm -hmm. two carts, one for even, one for odd. It worked until they got out of sync, but you know, <laughs> hey, these are carts, it's, that's what happens. Um, it's amazing when I look back, it's amazing that we were able to do what we did with tapes and carts and relays and stepper switches and, <laughs> and, and I mean, they, we didn't even have PCs. So if you had an automation like a, you know, a Shaper 903 or something that was pretty advanced, you know, they, 
they had to build a computer from scratch with their own with their own operating system. Yeah, there it all is. You know, um, uh, like I say, it's amazing that that uh, the manufacturers were able to make this stuff work, and and uh, the programming people like us were able to uh, produce programming that sounded good on the air. Uh, the the Drake Chenault stations typically were medium and small market. We, you know, we were never in LA or San Francisco or New York. You know, we were for medium and small market stations. But if the uh, station was on its toes and they, and they kept things, you know, properly tweaked up and aligned and, you know, working right, uh, our formats really sounded good. And our stations were consistently uh, number one rated stations in their market. So what, what we were doing worked really well and it was really cost effective for the station. You know, for a couple thousand dollars a month, you had what sounded like big time radio, you know, major market radio on a small station that was fairly easy to, uh, to manage. Yes, the gate's 55. As long as it didn't screw itself into the basement. <laughs> or, or up into the ceiling. Or yes, the it ceiling. was the, or get your, it, it, it or was get the your elevator from hand, hell. Or get your hand in the wrong place while it was doing it. I remember seeing some of those at KCTC in Sacramento. Um, they had gates 55s, and then I think they had upgraded the entire system to a, a Harris 9000 and added go-karts and other things to that system. That was, that was an interesting format to hear. I saw KCTC in 82 or 83. They had uh -huh. one of, I think, three ti uh, temperature announcers in addition oh, to the really? time announcer. Yeah. yeah I, I well, used... Go ahead, Dave. It worked well if you were incrementing the temperature up during the day or down at night, but it would have a sample and hold circuit. This is your temperature, would charge a cap that much, and it had to match a voltage from the cart, which was set <laughs> by an increasingly long Q-tone. <laughs> so it would have to wear out the cart to get back around to the temperature <laughs> you had. Oh, boy. Rube Goldberg would be proud. I, yeah, I program there in Dallas got into the console. Uh, one, of our groups, one, of our, one of our groups today is uh, another veteran, uh, just like Hank. And, and I, I want to give Clay a chance to talk about his time at IGM. No, I did not work at IGM. Oh, I thought you, somebody said you did. They lied. No, 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 no. I, I, had oh, a, uh, I inherited a system that was made by IGM. Ah. at KMO in Tacoma in 1966. And it was a Shaver 800. Oh, I can tell you war stories about that machine. Four racks of, uh, oh my gosh. And it, it was kind of interesting. The, the story I love to tell about this is that the owner of the station read the contract and it said if he stopped making payments that IGM would repossess the equipment. And so what he did is he stopped making payments and he notified them that he wasn't going to make any more payments. And so he instructed me one day to load those four racks of equipment. And I put it in the back of a van and I drove from Tacoma to Bellingham, went up to the loading dock of IGM and I says, I've got some equipment here for you. And uh, that was my first meeting with Irv Law, <laughs> who later became BSW, as you all know. But uh, it, that was a, an interesting machine. I can tell you lots of stories about keeping that thing going. But I did not work for IGM. That was my IGM experience. What you got here, Hank? Well, this is when, when I built the consoles for Drake Chadal, um a funny thing happened. I had enough spare parts left over to build one for myself. So, <laughs> oh. so that's what you're seeing here. And yes, this is my license plate. <laughs> that's the real deal. So if you ever see somebody in Southern California with this license plate, you'll know it's me. 
Cool. I, th I think your left channel is about a tenth of a dB hot. Yeah. <laughs> a question about the heads that you had built. The, uh -huh. uh, the and somebody had mentioned Nagra heads, and I forget what the degree of, of azimuth change is. But that center track head that records the sync track uh, on on the Nagra is at an angle relative to what the two audio carrying heads are, or uh, azimuth is. Did you have them slanted in such a way to minimize crosstalk? Between no, the two tones uh, and such. No, um, it was a one kilohertz Q, so. You'd have the, the the azimuth would have to be laying on its side before it would make any difference. Uh, no, uh, our our crosstalk was was good enough. We recorded those that Q tone at about minus twenty, um, because you know that would keep it from creeping into the audio channels. Uh, but uh, it was it was standard uh, the same azimuth as uh, as the other as the other stuff. Um, I'll show you a picture of, this is our, um, this was the master playback for the duplicating hmm. system. Oh, cool. These are uh, MCI playback amps, which I, I sort of modified. There's two knobs for each channel. One is for level and the other is for playback EQ. So those alignment tones that were on the master tape, the uh, duplicating engineer would tweak the playback EQ um, to put it dead on the money. So there was no uh, EQ error when the tapes were made. And then down here, uh, this is the scope selector. This is a vector scope to look at head azimuth. And uh, there were 24 Technics uh, slave recorders split into two groups of 12. So the duplicating guy could switch this thing around and look at the playback of every Technics deck before duplicating actually started. So what he would do is uh, um, first he'd put the scope in master and he'd tweak the head alignment on the master to, uh, to that particular tape. And then he'd hit the start button here, uh, set the mode selector to 700 hertz, and that would squirt a 700 hertz tone into all the decks. And he would visually scan the meters on all the decks to be sure everything was recording at zero. Then he'd switch it over to 10 kilohertz, and then switch this over to slave, and look at the playback azimuth of every slave to be sure it was within, you know, 20 degrees or so at 10 kilohertz, actually 20 kilohertz because it was running at double speed. And once everything was tweaked, playback azimuth, record azimuth, playback EQ, levels, everything, then um, uh, you'd hit the run, you put this switch in run and start the master tape playing back. So now all the master, uh, all the copies were being recorded from the master. Uh, but this is the, these are the things that we did that nobody knew about that uh, kept all the tapes so consistent from, you know, week to week, month to month, year to year. Oh, cool. there's no other way to do it. Uh, just because, you know, you can take, oh, there's another trick I, that I, I'll mention. I don't have a photo of this. Um, well, maybe I do. Yeah, whatever. When we, um, back in the days when we were sending masters over to Superscope for high-speed duplication, we discovered that quarter inch tape, it's not exactly a quarter inch. It's pretty close to a quarter inch. It's point, the minor, at the bottom end, it's 0 0.0244. And at the top end, it's 0 0.0247. So you got about a three to four mil window there. Well, we discovered that 
we would have better luck and better phase stability on the copies if we used fat tape for the master. So I would take a box of pancakes and a micrometer. I thought I had a picture of that. Let me see if I can, I'm not gonna look now. I had a micrometer, a machinist micrometer, you know, the one that has a knurled thing at one end. And I would go through a box of pancakes and screen out the ones that measured 0247 to 02475. And those are the ones that we use to make submasters that were sent for high-speed duplication. Who would have thunk, you know? Um, Hank, when you say high-speed, are you talking seven and a half master to 15 or 30 ips? Uh, no, it, these were um, uh, running at, they would usually run at eight times normal speed. So they, the master and the slave were both running at 60 IPS. Uh, that's, that's typically what they ran at. Of course, it's very wideband electronics, so frequency response is not a problem. Um, and the tape bias is up at around a megahertz or something like that. Um, but uh, it's hard to keep an eye on things when, when things are flying past at eight times normal speed. Um, and of course, that was another generation. We were those super scope copies were three generation, two generations down from the master. When we did our own in-house duplication, it was only one generation down from the master. So you know that helped. So Hank, did how you, did you how did you minimize print through on those one mil tapes? Uh, you, you can't, uh, but it wasn't a problem. Uh, we never had any print through issues. Um, the only time you heard print through was in the the dead tape between songs, but you never heard that on the air. Um, and print through is relative. No matter what level you record at, the print through is the same. So, uh, but we never had any print through issues. Did you do any kind of, a, of an equalization adjustment to anticipate generation loss? Nope. We kept everything dead flat. Um, the, uh, everything from the phono cartridge to the client copy was flat as a pancake. We didn't have any internal house EQ. Uh, once we went to the MCI mastering recorders, we had better headroom than we did in the old Sony stuff. Uh, so there was no limiting, no compression. Whatever was on the vinyl, that's what we put on the tape, uh, on, the, on the client copy, pretty much virgin. We didn't mess around with, you know, jacking up the high end or doing anything like that. So uh, everything, because again, you know, once you start doing that and you've got, you know, six different engineers doing it, mm. they all have different ears. So you can't let that get into the system. You just have to set it everything, you know, set everything up uh, for flat response in the whole system and just let it go there. My well, memory exactly. might, be, uh, might be tricking me, but it seems to me that, Part of the reason for the tails out was to reduce print through and also to improve the attack of the audio when yeah. it was beginning. Tails out doesn't do anything for print through. Uh, but it, like you say, it does help a little bit with leading, uh, it going forwards, leading transients because they become trailing transients when you're duplicating. And of course, also that way the copies come up heads out without having to be rewound. Uh, it, also, it also takes better care of the tape in storage because you rewind it fast and you play it smoothly, neatly back onto right. the other hub. So it stores, the, yeah. the edges don't get damaged. Yeah. And if, and if I'm not mistaken, print through, because uh, if you're rewinding really fast, that's when you have run the risk of print through because the tape is tighter than possible. So the ma magnet, magnetism can transfer. Um, what is the, uh, forgive my ignorance, what, what was the difference between the Drake Chenault system and the Schalke system? Um, I don't, I, what was the Schalke system? I don't know. Schalke is mean, what became Bonneville and so forth later on. You mean as far as elevator and all that stuff? 
I'm sorry. I, I don't know. I'm not. I I was never familiar with with what they were doing or how they were doing it. Yeah, with Shulky, it was all about real it, big. Yeah, it was all about beautiful music. So it they didn't mind the heartbeat pause between things, but they wanted yeah. it absolutely. Herb Joel wanted that absolutely consistent. Um, but I think the pre-roll on their reels, it was less than a second, but it wasn't having to seg with anything. It was just, you needed to control, it had to be uniform. So the pause was, was correct. Uh, we had at one point about 83, uh, Shulky was sending Irv around. If you yeah. paid his airfare, he would come and see you. He visited us in Lubbock at KTEZ. Very nice man. And he knew a lot of stuff. We didn't, we were just children. I mean, we were, we were learning to build better amplifiers and turning these things in for grades at Texas Tech. <laughs> uh, we didn't, we'd never seen a wow and flutter analyzer. We'd record a tone and then reference it to the oscillator that made it to see, can we watch this on a scope and make it wobble less? That's, yeah. Yeah. That's not, it's not the same thing, but Irv took apart one of our, Scully 270s now, you know, looks at some bearings. It's like, what cotton gin did these come out of? <laughs> so I have a question. I was about a long-term front friend of Irv, so I can re relate with him saying that stuff. Go ahead. So Irv. how did you deal with uh, tape formulation and bias adjustment? Well, again, that's why every studio had an oscillator in it. You know, every time one of the guys put a new reel of tape on to start a master, uh, they knew how to tweak the level, uh, check the record EQ, check the bias. You know, they knew how to, you know, put the oscillator on at 10 kilohertz, turn the bias up until it peaked, and then it fell back a couple of dB, and then adjust the record EQ until it matched. Oh, the other trick we did was alignment tapes. We had a magnetic reference lab make custom alignment tapes for us because we've discovered that uh, Scotch 177 one mil tape going through a machine would often behave differently than the one and a half mil back coated tape that was used for alignment tapes. So um, to uh, get rid of another potential problem, we had uh, Jay McKnight up at MRL record custom alignment tapes for us. And those were sent out to our client stations and they were recorded on the same tape stock that we used for the client copies. And the studio, the, the Drake Chenault Studios, they had those alignment tapes. So those were identical to what the stations had because they came off the same pancake of tape. Um, so um, before anybody would put a reel of tape on a machine, they would run the alignment tape through it first and set playback level, playback EQ, and playback azimuth, you know, phase. Um, and it was the, the same, you know, we would have 500 alignment tapes recorded on a, on a 10 inch reel. And every studio would get one, we would replace them about once a week. And then every client would get one. They were short, you know, they only had half a dozen tones on them. So, you know, each alignment tape only ran about two minutes. So on a 10 inch reel, one mil tape, you know, there were dozens of these things. So we would, uh, you know, that was a, that was another trick of the trade. And you, uh, were you were degaussing between? Say again? You were degaussing heads? No, we never degaussed the heads. That's kind of a, I think that's a myth. I don't know that any, I've, I've never seen <laughs> any improvements of anybody degaussing heads, uh, especially with pro gear, because when a, when a pro recorder goes out of record mode, you know, and you hit the stop button, it doesn't cut off the bias like that. It ramps it down. So essentially, every time you push the stop button, it's degaussing the heads. Um, so you never had to degauss the guides or anything on, on the deck? No, because they're non-magnetic. 
Those are all stainless steel. Oh, here's another trick. Here's another trick we did on the MCI machines. When they first came in, you know, they have tape guides that, you know, guide the tape as it goes through the path. Well, uh, when we first started using those things, we were noticing a fair amount of azimuth creep. You know, you could put a 15 kilohertz tone on there and it would look like this and then it would kind of wobble around. So I started looking real close at the, at the tape going over the heads and sure enough, it was doing this just a little bit. So I got my trusty micrometer out and sure enough, MCI had machined the tape guides a little on the wide side. They were, they were set to about 0.252. And we knew that tape was never more than 0.247. Um, so I pulled those things out, gave them to a machinist and told him here, make something that's just like this but instead of having the, the instead of having the gap be you know 0.255 or whatever it was, bring it down to like 2485. You know that'll give it that'll be really tight. And uh, when we swapped the guides out of the MCIs, dead on the money. You could set the azimuth so that it was you know looking like this at 15k, and it would wiggle around just a little bit, but not much. A lot better than what was originally, you know, the original equipment. So those the, those heads were not undercut. So what happened over time when the heads developed a bit of a channel long before the pole pieces really got too thin? They, they, I, were, they, they were undercut heads. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, the first heads we had made by Saki, because those were ferrite. And I figured, great, we'll have them made once. We'll never have to replace them. But it turned out the Saki ferrite heads... Uh, had a little too much crosstalk. So I ended up going to Nortronics um, and they made uh, conventional heads. At the time, uh, they had perfected their Duracore head formulation and those things last. Uh, and they were under, and we did have the heads undercut so they wouldn't cut any grooves in the, in the whole piece. Um, and those heads were a long time. Hank, I heard you say you didn't like the crown reel to reels. Did you try the 800 series? Uh, no, just the 700s. 800s, same difference, but with, with um, uh, logic, what I called motion sickness. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, uh, I, I, I had always thought crown stuff was really good. I mean, back from the days when I was 14 years old and I would drool over it at the local stereo store, you know. And uh, the crown recorders were uh, really backwards in their design in, in that uh, on any professional recorder, and, and for that matter, matter, even the better Sony and Tascam stuff, you know, the tape path, nobody uses pressure pads anymore. That was something for cheap consumer machines back in the 60s, you know. The, the tape would just lay across the heads during normal playback, and then you'd have lifters that would pull it away from the heads during uh, rewind and fast forward. Well, the crown machines didn't work like that. Uh, they had a tape path that was straight, and the heads were behind that straight line. And when you hit the play button, this big old nasty solenoid, there, there were these things, I forget what they called them, but they were these, these glass rods that would push the tape against the heads. So in essence, it was like pressure pads, except it wasn't a pad on the head. It was a glass rod on either side of the head. And Every time that solenoid came up, it didn't always come up in the same place. And that would affect the tape path. And these glass rods would get grooves worn into them by the tape going past them all the time. It was just a really, it was just a 
a really half-assed design. And the mm -hmm. other thing that, that just blew me away uh, was the, the capstan on the crown machines was driven, it was a flywheel driven, belt driven off of a motor. Yeah. Well, it, the speed change, well, remember it pulled a pulley. Was, yeah, the speed was not accurate on them. After a while, uh, we started getting the, one station would call up and said, these tapes sound kind of slow. I had never even thought to check the speed. I mean, it's a crown machine. It's got to be dead on the money. It's a professional machine. I never checked the speed. So, uh, yeah, a station called up and said, God, tape sounds slow. So I took, got, a, you know, one of those little strobe things. And sure enough, a lot of, a lot of the machines were running fast. Well, so I called Crown. I said, what, what the hell here? And he says, well, yeah, there's a, a screw on the back of the flywheel. And you adjust that to produce enough drag to slow it down. Oh, God. You know, this is something that's going to change every week. So, um, so that was a real disappointment. I, I, what I did is I loosened the screw so the thing would run as fast as it ever could. And then I was able to measure exactly how fast the flywheel was running. And of course, every machine was a little bit different. So I was able to, to figure out, okay, well, this one is, you know, the diameter on this one is, is 1% too big or whatever it was. I forget, let's see, the diameter is too big. So that would mean the flywheel was actually running too slow, whatever it was. So I was able to send it out to a guy, a machinist guy, and tell him how far to machine down each flywheel uh, or each drive pulley. It was the drive pulley on the uh, motor that had to be smaller. So I was able to compensate for it. And once I did that, then we were okay. But I was not a big fan of crown machines after that. So did what model MCI? ITCs? Yeah. IRA, say again? Yeah, I was wondering what model MCIs, because the JH-110s had the ceramic capstans and yeah. the marvelous... Uh, motor that would go from zero to full lock before <laughs> the pitch roller hit them. Pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, pretty amazing. Yeah, they were the MC, uh, the 110. I think they were the A's in those days. These were ordered in 78. So that was... Yep, and the one, one problem with those were the connections on the ICs would start to get a little resistive and you'd have all kinds of issues with the servos. Yeah, they... Uh, the, the MCI was basically an analog computer for the transport control, and it drifted. I, I wish Ampex had brought out the ATR 800 a few years earlier. Those are beautiful machines. Um, oh, the ATRs? The, the 800, ATR 800, which is a broadcast version of the 100. I had a couple of those at home, and they were just superb. But that was like the ATRs. All the whole ATR series were magnificent. Oh, they didn't have any pinch rollers or anything. Yeah, yeah. That was the finest tape yeah. machine. Yeah. When I first saw the ATR 800s at uh, the NAB show in, it was like 82, 83. And uh, <laughs> the, the sales guy for Ampex, when Ampex had a booth, he said, well, these are designed by Ampex, but they're actually manufactured in Japan by TIAC. Right. So being a smart ass, I said, oh, so these are really a Tampex. He, he was not amused. <laughs> but, Did you ever use the ITC 750s and 850s? They were uh, junk. Uh, yeah, yeah. They had the same problem as the early MCI transports. They, they had no slack in the tape path, you know. So that makes them really dangerous, you know, because when you go from yep. play to stop or rewind to stop or whatever, it's not a smooth transition and you need a little bit of, a little bit of give in the tape path, which is normally provided by an idler, you know, a moving idler on the, 
on the left side usually. Uh, Ampex 440s had it. Um, Studers have it, uh, but the, the, the ITC real decks did not, and the early MCI decks did not. And that, that made them really vulnerable to uh, tape snags and tape jams and all that kind of thing. But I guess the later MCIs, they added a roller that had a little bit of give to it, but it wasn't very much. Wasn't that after Sony bought them? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The Japanese knew how to do that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, uh, you know, the MCIs were very advanced for their day, but uh, other stuff like the Ampex 800s and uh, the Otari MTRs blew them away. But those didn't come out until, you know, the mid 80s. So there you go. Well, that ATR 100 series, the 102 or however many heads you had, and, and that was the most sophisticated machine ever built. Oh, yeah. Well, that thing had, you had one knob and you turned it and everything ran back and forth in perfect sync. Yeah, yeah, those, those, those are still rollers. used. Those are the, the, the gold standard even today in yeah. those videos. You know, those things are worth a mint. And those Technics, RS 1500s, those are worth a fortune these days. Um, yeah. Okay, well, I will, I will uh, scoot out of here. Um, but thanks again, guys. It was a lot of fun. Good to see you all. And um, we'll do it again. <laughs> thanks, thank you. Talk about some other uh, ancient uh, technology. Um, I'll show you my Beatles. 78 RPM records. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Hank. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. Take care.